Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our fourth Tea with Tops. We are so excited to present Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum tonight. Um, I'm Jen Slish, your tops, current tops chair, and I have Allison Shaver here. And hello, everybody. <laughs> are we ready? Yeah, let's go. I'm going to start it off with just a brief introduction. So uh, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, uh, President Emerita of Spelman College, is a clinical psychologist widely known for both her expertise on race relations and as a thought leader in higher education. Her 13 years as the president of Spelman College from 2002 to 2015 were marked by innovation and growth, and her visionary leadership was recognized in 2013 with the Carnegie Academic Leadership Award. The author of several books, including The Best Room, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, and Other, race, and other Conversations About Race, and Can We Talk About Race, and Other Conversations in an Era of School Resegregation, Dr. Tatum is a sought after speaker on the topics of racial identity development, race and education, strategies for creative inclusive campus environments, and higher educa education leadership. In 2005, Dr. Tatum was awarded the prestigious Brock International Prize in ed Education for her innovative leadership in the field. A fellow of the American Psychological Association, she was the 2014 recipient of the APA Award for Outstanding Lifetime Contributions to Psychology. She holds a BA degree in psychology from Wesleyan University and an M MA and PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan, as well as an MA in religious studies from Hartford Seminary. Over the course of her career, she has served as a faculty member at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Westfield State University, and Mount Holyoke College. Prior to her 2002 appointment as president of Spelman, she served as dean and acting president at Mount Holyoke College. In spring 2017, she was the Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor at Stanford University. A civic leader in the Atlanta community, Dr. Tatum is engaged in educational initiatives designed to expand educational opportunity for underserved students and their families. In Atlanta, she serves on the governing boards of the Westside Future Fund, Achieve Atlanta, Morehouse College, and the Tull Charitable Foundation. She is also on the boards of Smith College and the Educational Testing Service. Our discussion this evening is being held with the support of the American Psychological Foundation, David and Carol Myers Fund to support teachers of psychology in secondary schools. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Tatum. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jen now for our first question. Okay, what an impressive resume. Wow. <laughs> um, and that's probably just the highlights. Um, so could you tell us what you're currently working on in the field of psychology or education? Sure, well, let me begin by just saying thank you for having me this uh, today, this evening for some, this afternoon for others, I guess, mm -hmm. depending on your time zone. Um, I am delighted to be here and uh, sharing just a little bit about psychology um, as I experience it in my professional career. I am a clinical psychologist by training, and as you know from um, the various things that I've written, my particular research interest has been, over the course of my career, the experiences of Black youth in predominantly white settings. I've been interested in racial identity development of adolescents. Um, particularly Black adolescents, though, of course, I've written about identity development for other groups as well, and uh, teaching about the psychology of racism and the classroom dynamics associated with that. So since I left the presidency, I served as president for 13 years, and I will say, on behalf of presidents everywhere, you can't do much research while you're being the president. Um, but when I retired from that role in 2015, my goal was to really update my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? It was originally published in 1997, and recognizing that 2017 would be the 20th anniversary of its release, uh, the publisher asked me if I would consider 
updating it. And I thought this was really something um, that would be a very worthwhile project. Because one of the things that I thought about while I was serving as president was that most of the students I was interacting with in the role as a, you know, as a college president, most of the students coming to college in the late teens, right, 20, teens in their lives, but also teens as in the 21st century, those kids coming in 2015, 2016, um, those kids who were coming to college or graduating during that time weren't even alive when I wrote my book in 1997. And so I really wanted to think about what the world looked like from their point of view. What would it seem, uh, you know, what, how did they think about their identity? How were they thinking about uh, racism and as they were experiencing it in the United States in particular. So these were the things that I was thinking about and I wanted to update the book and that's what I worked on from 2015 to 2017. Once the book came out, I have to say I've spent most of my time since then being out pre-COVID <laughs> when we could be out and about, um, being out talking about um, the findings in the book and sharing that information, mostly on college and university campuses, um, though certainly at APA and at other um, major gatherings of psychologists as well as other educational conferences. So I've been more speaking than writing in this last um, period, and certainly that's been true this summer. People have been referring to the summer post uh, the horrible murder of George Floyd as a summer of racial reckoning. Certainly it's been a summer of people wanting to think about racism in our society. And um, so I've been spending a lot of my time on Zoom conversations with people about um, what this all means for their workplace, for their school setting, for their family lives, as parents and educators both are trying to figure out how to talk to children and young adults about these issues. That's what's been keeping me busy. <laughs> well, sounds like you have definitely been busy. Um, so I think a lot of us have probably read your book, um, Why Do All the Black Kids, or Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And so a lot of the questions that we have are kind of related to how can we take some of that material and implement it into our own classrooms and our school cultures? Um, so can we start off with you explaining a little bit about racial identity development theory, and um, perhaps if you have some ways that you could um, share with us on how we can better, be better in our classrooms at teaching that. Sure. Well, let me start out by saying that um, racial identity development, identity development, let's just start with identity development. Mm. One of the things we know is that adolescents in general um, are thinking a lot about that question, who am I? Right, that's a quintessential adolescent question. Um, and that notion of, you know, who, who should I be friends with? Who do, what should I do with my future? What will I study if I go to college? You know, what, how, who do I wanna be in the world? What does my future look like? How do other people perceive me? These questions of identity are important to every adolescent. And we know that one of the reasons they're important to adolescents, it has everything to do with the adolescent brain, right? We know that as the brain matures, um, as kids are growing physiologically, as they enter puberty, it's not just their bodies that are changing, but their brains are also changing. And as the brain further develops, you're able to think more abstractly, right, about abstract math problems, but also abstract social um, concerns. So this whole question of identity is very much related to the development of adolescence. But as you're thinking about who am I and how do other people see me and who will I be in the world? Certainly, if you are a young person of color, that question is going to be shaped in part by the, your understanding of how people will view you. Um, if you are, I sometimes use this as an example, if you are a seven-year-old black boy and let's say you're a cute kid and people think you're cute and they strike up conversations with you uh, when you're waiting in the school lobby or whatever, um, 
that same still good looking boy um, at 16 or 17 elicits a different response, right? That kid walking down the street isn't being stopped by people who think he's cute. He's being stopped by people maybe who's, maybe he's being hassled by the police. Maybe he's noticing that people are clutching their purses a little tighter as he approaches. Maybe he's notice, noticing that maybe even people are crossing the street to avoid him. That there are, um, there's feedback in the environment that signals to young people of color that their racial group membership matters. And it makes a difference in terms of how people perceive them. And so because they are increasingly aware of that, they are also thinking about, well, what does this mean? What does this mean in terms of who I should be relating to? What does this mean in terms of my future? What does this mean in terms of my career choice? These are all the kinds of questions that um, every adolescent is thinking about, but if you are a racial minority in the United States, those questions also have this other layer um, related to your racial group membership that will be part of that development. So as you are maturing, you're starting to try to figure this out. Um, and some of what you're thinking about will be determined by the feedback you get, not just from your teachers or your parents, but from your peers. And so wanting to have the acceptance of your peers, wanting to know what your peers think, you know, what is, what's it cool to wear? What's the music I should be listening to? What's the language I should be using? You know, all of that is part of the identity process. We know that as kids are thinking about that, there is often a desire to connect with other peers who are also thinking about those questions, um, who are sharing that experience. And, you know, if a kid is in a racially mixed school, um, he might have had a very diverse group of friends in elementary school, but maybe as he's moving into puberty or she's moving into puberty um, in middle school or high school, that friendship group might get more and more homogeneous because they're connecting with kids who are having the same kinds of experiences that they're having. That, and that you know, leads to the quintessential question, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Of course, the white kids are also sitting together in the cafeteria, um, but we tend to focus our attention on that um, minority group in this context. Mm -hmm. So racial identity development is a process that um, unfolds. And you know, I describe in the book the different stages um, or phases, maybe that's a better word, the different phases of that identity development process of one of active exploration, one of immersing yourself in these identity questions with a peer group, um, and then eventually internalizing and defining in a more adult way what it really means to you to be a member of a particular racial or ethnic group. But that process, that, that maturing process is not likely to be seen in high school. It's more likely to show up after high school. Um, but the question about how to talk about it, I find, um, I have found in my own teaching that providing students some information about racial identity development theory, um, and when I talk about theory, I talk about the work of William Cross, for example, who wrote about African American identity development. I talk about the work of Janet Helms, who wrote also about Black identity development, but she also wrote about white racial identity development theory. We don't often talk about white racial identity development theory, but it is also um, a useful model. And I find that, of course, you know, students could read my book, um, but it's a pretty hefty book and maybe it's, uh, you know, not what a, um, a, a high school teacher wants to spend all of the class time on. But there are articles, for example, I wrote an article um, a long time ago, but it is still available. And in fact, I have a link to it on my own website. Uh, but the title of that article was Talking About Race, um, Learning About Racism, The Application of Racial Identity Development Theory in the Classroom. It's a short article, about 20 pages long. And it has a lot of quotes in it from students. Students who are, it was published in the Harvard Educational Review back in 1992. 
So it's really an old article, but still relevant and still, um, uh, still an article that people cite still. And because it's written with a lot of student voices, um, students might find it particularly interesting to read. But I, I also find that once students have an understanding of racial identity development theory, and this article gives an overview of that, then it's interesting to them to maybe try to apply it, not just to themselves, but maybe to um, somebody's biography. I used to, when I was teaching back in the day, um, I used to ask uh, students to read the autobiography of Malcolm X, for example, and use the theory to kind of um, track his development. Now that's an old book and people could still read it and many students would find it of interest. They might find it of more interest to read um, President Barack Obama's memoir um, about Dreams of My Father, um, because, or Dreams from My Father, I think is the title. Um, but you can, when you read about his adolescence, growing up in Hawaii, um, trying to figure out his own identity as a young biracial man who is identifying as black because that's how he looks and that's how people respond to him. Um, you can track his own racial identity development, his seeking out of a peer group, his desire to immerse himself, his, you know, his real effort to try to figure out what does it mean to be a young man of color growing up at this time. And, um, and students might find that a really interesting exercise to learn something about the identity development and then try to apply it to the life of someone they know. That's awesome. Um, Rob McIntyre from Lincoln, Nebraska asked a question in the um, Q&A. And if you guys listening have questions, you can put them in the chat bar or in the Q&A. And if we'll try to get to them, can't promise anything. But this one goes right along with what we were just talking about. Rob asks, should we teach social identity theory, like the in-group, out-group, along with racial identity theory, or are they distinct things that should be kept separate? Should one of them be covered in development and one in social psych? Um, I would separate them, though they're not unrelated, um, as his question suggests. Um, but certainly this notion of in-group and out-group um, it's right in with social psychology. I mean, it's that's what it is, right? And um, identity development could certainly be understood in a developmental psychology sequence. And one of the things we can say about when we talk about development, um, when we talk about um, developmental psychology, you know, I used to teach a, when I was a full-time faculty member before I became an administrator, I taught a number of different things. And one of the courses I taught was child development. And when I looked at the child development textbooks, one of the things that always bothered me about them was that there was very little about um, kids of color. You know, that I'm sure it's better today than it was when I was teaching back then, but um, very few pictures of kids of color in the textbook. And when you found them, usually it had to do with something related to deviance. For example, the, if there was a chapter on um, fetal alcohol syndrome, there'd be a picture of a kid of color, uh, for example. Um, so talking about racial or ethnic identity development as part of a normal developmental process um, as you're looking at child development, we're talking about Erickson stages, right? You know, Eric Erickson and the eight stages of man, you know, if that's a classic um, part of what you're studying and he talks about identity crisis in adolescence as, you know, the core a task of the adolescent, talking about racial identity development in that context makes a lot of sense. Okay, great, thank you. So Christina Janice from Wrightstow, New Jersey, is curious how we can help our students develop a more positive identity in and out of our classrooms. Remember, we're high school teachers, and I know that you said that a lot of the racial um, identity doesn't develop until after high school, but what about just a positive identity in general? 
Yeah. Well, actually, there is a lot of it happening in high school. It doesn't finish in high school. That's really what I'm trying to communicate. Okay. But certainly, um, adolescents are in the throes of it in high school, for sure. <laughs> And, uh, and you might even see that as a teacher, you know, if you knew a young person um, in the eighth grade, let's say, he goes away for the summer, she goes away for the summer, she comes back in the ninth grade, and she's looking different, or he's wearing different clothes, or has taken on a different style of walking, or, you know, has sort of, uh, his self-presentation has changed. You'll wonder what happened to that kid. Well, what happened is identity development. And part of what that child is exploring is how do I want to present myself? And who do I want to be like? And who, what, what's my peer group? And how, you know, all of those things are part of um, that process. And so how can we foster positive, a, uh, a positive sense of identity? We can provide affirmation um, in terms of, representing kids and their backgrounds in positive ways. I like to use this analogy, and maybe your teachers will um, appreciate it, but let's imagine, let's imagine all of us were in the same room together and someone with a wide angle lens was taking a photo, a group photo of all of us. And after, at the end of the evening, we each got a copy of that photo. What's the first thing each of us is going to do when we get our copy of the photo? Look to see how you look. <laughs> That's right. You're going to look for yourself, right? That is the first thing. You know, we might look for other people afterwards, but first we're going to look for ourselves. And we, we're going to look for ourselves at, and we're going to find ourselves in the picture or try. And once we found ourselves, then we're going to evaluate how we look right? Was I smiling? Are my eyes open? I should have worn a different shirt that day. Whatever it is, you know, we'll, we will be evaluating. In the context of this analogy, think about coming to school and experiencing the curriculum as like a group photo. You are looking for yourself in it. Some kids see themselves in it all the time, other kids never see themselves in the picture. They never see themselves in the picture. And some, let's imagine we took that group photo and somebody photoshopped you out of the picture. You know, you were digitally removed. So you get your copy, you're looking for yourself, you can't find yourself. At first, you would say, what's wrong with this picture? I was there, you know, how come I'm missing? But let's imagine time after time after time this photo is taken and always your picture is missing. After a while, you wouldn't say, what's wrong with this picture? You would say, what's wrong with me? That's right, what's wrong with me or people like me? How come we're never in the picture? And so if we want to affirm the identities of all of our students, one of the things we can really think very intentionally about is making sure everyone sees themselves in the picture and not just in the picture alone, but in the picture and looking good, right? You know, you don't want to be in the picture except when they're not in the picture, except when they're talking about fetal alcohol syndrome, for example, right? That's not in the picture looking good. So we want to be in the picture when they're talking about you know, high achievement. We want to be in the picture when we're talking about um, motivation, you know, intrinsic or extrinsic motivation, you know, all the, all the different ways that we might be represented. Everybody wants to see themselves in the picture. So to come back to the question of how do we reinforce a positive identity, let's make sure we've got them in the picture somewhere. Um, and um, that could be not just in the textbook, but maybe in the supplemental reading, maybe in the posters on the walls, maybe in, you know, the examples that we're using. We, um, before our conversation started officially, um, I'll tell our viewers that the three of us were having a chat about research methods. Well, if you're teaching research methods, there's certain principles you want your kids to know about, right? You want them to understand the difference between the independent variable and the dependent variable. You want them to understand 
about you know ethical concerns related to um, doing research with human subjects. You want them to, or animals for that matter, you want them to understand, um, you know, data analysis. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of different ways to talk about research methods, but there are lots of great experiments that you can use to um, illustrate the independent and the dependent variable. You know, are there um, research experiments? Are there experiments that you can use that bring in different voices? I was mentioning that I really liked when I was teaching introductory psychology and at the college level, and you know, the difference between a college freshman and a high school senior is not much, right? You know, it's, it's a summer. Um, so if it's the fall semester of that college freshman's year, you know, fresh, fresh person's year, first year student's year, and you're talking about um, research methods, I used to like to use uh, Claude Steele's uh, experiment on stereotype threat. His classic stereotype threat article was published in 1995. It is a beautifully designed, very elegantly designed experiment. Um, and so it really illustrates sort of great experimental design and also gives you an opportunity to talk about stereotype threat and what causes it. And today in 2020, we can also talk about research that's been done that shows how you can mitigate it. Um, you know, research that shows how uh, a teacher can give feedback in a way that reduces stereotype threat. Um, these are ideas that might actually impact um, someone's performance. Another example of this might be um, attribution theory. So in, you know, a, another concept in social psychology. So let's imagine you're a freshman in college or a high school senior, and you're learning about attribution theory I used to like to teach about it at the beginning of the semester because it had everything to do with persistence, depending on how I talked about it. So, for example, if I used as an example of attribution theory, how we explain things, you don't do well on the first exam. You can explain that as either, I'm not any good at that. I'm not, I don't have the innate ability for psychology. Um, or you could, explain it, I didn't put in enough effort. My effective effort, you know, I didn't study enough. Um, if I use an effort explanation, I can fix that, I can improve. If I use an innate ability, you either know it, you either have it or you don't, right? You either have a knack for psychology or you don't. Um, if I use an ability explanation, I'm not likely to uh, persist in the same way. So, just talking about that is an intervention, right? Mm -hmm. Just explaining, I mean, I can talk about it as an, and as an explanation of a psychological concept. I could also talk about it as an explanation of a research design. But in talking about the fact that we can either make an ability attribution or an effort attribution, and it makes a difference in terms of their persistence uh, when we come up against a challenging circumstance, just the conversation might shift a student's thinking about his or her capacity to be successful. Definitely. I, that is such an incredible analogy too about the group photo. It's something that I've never thought of and very powerful. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's outstanding. Um, and my wheels are turning and I'm taking notes and mm -hmm. Allison and I are probably going to FaceTime after this and talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, so as an educator, um, what issues do you feel are most pressing in our classrooms today? Well, I will say right this moment, I think the, you know, um, current events are most pressing. I think that there's so much going on. Um, we are living in a historic moment, you know, not in our lifetimes have we experienced anything like this pandemic, this uh, virus pandemic. And certainly for students, um, not in their lifetimes have they experienced anything like uh, the kind of racial um, 
reckoning that has been happening. You know, I came of age, I, I was born in 1954. And so I was a teenager when uh, Dr. King was assassinated. I was, um, you know, 10 years old when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed and 11 years old when uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, you know, the, the civil rights stuff that students think of as ancient history all happened in my lifetime. So um, as I'd like to say to my kids, and I'm not that old, right? <laughs> so, um, but having said that, if we look at, you know, if you're, if you're 17 right now, um, let's make it a little younger. Let's say you're 15. If you're 15 right now in 2020, that means you were born in 2005, you know? <laughs> and so, <laughs> I mean, that's mind boggling in and of itself, right? <laughs> But if you were born in 2005, you know, President Obama was elected in 2008, most of your childhood, um, we had a black president in the White House. And that, while that seemed like an historic and uh, revolutionary thing to somebody like me born in 1954, if you're born in 2005, that's just business as usual, right? And so now we are in, um, we see the pain surrounding the um, deaths of so many black men at the hands of police and not just black men, also some black women and um, the protesting that's taking place. And there's just so much social upheaval right at this moment um, that I think it is really important to be able to have conversations about what's happening in our society, in the classroom to help young people make sense of it. I realize that you know there are lots of us as adults trying to make sense of it. Um, so if you know if you feel like, oh, how could I possibly have a conversation with kids about these things because I myself am overwhelmed by it, you know that that is a challenge. And so finding support, um, and I think peer to peer, teacher to teacher, is a great way to create that kind of um, support for those conversations. But I think those are important conversations to be having with young people right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Margaret Holgreave from Cedarburg, Wisconsin, and Michelle Guzman from Arlington, Texas, both had kind of a similar question about how we can do a better job at weaving Black psychologists into our curriculum. Um, do you have any resources? So Michelle is curious. She says, as a teacher of color, where can I find more studies and experiments um, published by Black, Indigenous, people of color researchers. Do you have any specific sites or resources that we could reference? Yes, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm, turn, I'm turning around looking at my bookshelf. You can see my bookshelf behind me. Yes, um, very there, there is a book called The Handbook of Multicultural Counseling. Ooh. Um, Handbook of Multicultural Counseling and I'm mentioning it because it's now, uh, it's published by Sage Press, um, S-A-G-E, Sage Press. Um, you know, it's now in multiple editions, like, you know, four, four or five editions, each, each one being a little different. But what each one, the reason I'm mentioning it in particular is because at the beginning of each edition of this Handbook of Multicultural Counseling, is a section titled Pioneers in the Field. And there are um, chapters by these uh, psychologists, all of whom are psychologists, or most of whom anyway, are psychologists of color from various backgrounds, you know, African American, Latinx, Indigenous, um, Asian American. Um, and they're reflecting on their own careers related to. Um, the field. And so you could, a, a teacher could look at that handbook and find um, one of the names of, you know, pioneering psychologists from various backgrounds, um, but also read something about them. You know, there are these autobiographical essays that they've written about how they became psychologists, what they worked on, you know, um, their interests and just those essays themselves might be actually very interesting to students. 
but certainly it would be a place to start um, because then you could look up those particular psychologists and see who did they cite, um, you know, and that would probably lead to some other names as well. Great, thank you so much for that. Amazing. I, and I, my wheels are turning still. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, what would you say when um, racist comments are made in our classroom, what can we do to educate and redirect? Because I think a lot of teachers are kind, they don't wanna embarrass a kid or they don't wanna say or do the wrong thing. So um, I'm totally fine saying you can't say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's some people. <laughs> What do you suggest? Like, what's the best way to handle that? Well, I think there's, I have two suggestions. And one suggestion goes, um, ha is something that you can do before the incident occurs, which is to say, let's imagine school's just starting and you know that there's a lot going on in the world related to race and you want to talk about it in your classroom. You might lay down some ground rules about that from the very beginning. So for example, you might say, you know, this, this fall, this semester, you know, the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking a lot about the issue of racism or, you know, race and racism in our classroom because there's so much of it going on. It relates to psychology. It's important for us to talk about it. But one of the things I know you could say is that these are hard this, these are hard conversations to have because one people don't all agree um, and two we've had different life experiences and three we all have misinformation about people different from ourselves right it's just part of growing up in my book why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria i talk about it like breathing smog you know that we there's so much misinformation there's so many stereotypes there's so many um, sources of misinformation, not just what our friends and family say, what we see on television, what we read in magazines, the images um, that we might see, even as kids growing up watching cartoons, all kinds of things um, influence how we view the other, right? Um, how we view other people. And if we recognize that it's so pervasive, like breathing smog, we have to acknowledge that all of us to some degree have been smog breathers. And if we're all smog breathers, one of the things we need to notice is that sometimes we will breathe out some smog. You know, if you breathe some in, sooner or later you're gonna breathe some out. And so my goal as the teacher would be to reduce the smog in my classroom right? I'm trying to reduce the smog, but I think it's important for each of us to recognize that even me, even me, the teacher, might on occasion, by accident, breathe out some smog. And if I do, I am certainly going to apologize for it. Um, and I want you to point it out to me. Because part of the challenge with all this smog going around is that we don't always know when we have breathed some out. So what you can hear in my little speech here is that I am acknowledging that we all are likely to make a mistake, um, that we all have misinformation, even me, the teacher, and that we all need to hold each other accountable as we are learning to reduce the smog, right? That's our goal, to clean up the air. But Having said that, if you've done that at the beginning, then what, and, and some people will even give um, language uh, to help each other, right? So if someone inadvertently, if, or some, sometimes people do it on purpose, we'll acknowledge that, but, um, but if someone breathes out some smog in a way that's hurtful to somebody else, Maybe we have a rule in our class that you can let that person know by saying, ouch, right? You know, you hear something that doesn't sit right, you can say, ouch. Um, and then we can pause and figure out what happened, right? That's one way to do that. Um, or, but, but what you hear in my um, example 
is by, by sort of setting the context for it. This is likely to happen. Something's going to happen. When it does, we're going to deal with it. Now, let's imagine you've said all that. Fast forward, a couple of weeks have gone by, and now somebody says something really problematic, maybe even on purpose. You know, maybe somebody uses a hurtful slur um, uh, because they have gotten mad and, you know, or, or they've said something. This happened to me once um, when I was teaching earlier in my career, much earlier, you know, I was a young faculty member and a student started talking about a particular ethnic group. Um, he didn't think there was anybody in the class from that ethnic group, but he was wrong, right? But he started talking about a particular ethnic group and referenced them as, you know, stealing and, you know, a lot of stereotypes. And there was a student who was from that ethnic group in my class, um, but who did not appear to be from that group, right? And so the, the student who made the comment didn't realize he was offending, but I knew it. And so, um, and even if I hadn't, even if somebody hadn't been in the class, I would want to have spoken up about it, but particularly since there was a student who was offended by this comment, I felt like I really needed to say something. And what I basically said is, you know, I'm hearing you say this, um, but I am wondering, but it sounds like a stereotype to me. I said, it sounds like a stereotype to me. And, you know, I, while I know that, you know, crime is committed by people from all groups, right? Um, I'm not sure the statistics bear out what you're saying. You know, I just raised a question about the, the accuracy of what the person was saying. And I said, you know, we, I think when we hear um, stereotypical information, we have to pause and think and ask the question, you know, is this true? Is this more true for this all the questions we might ask um, and, you know, what's the data um, to support that point of view or not. Sometimes um, something will happen in a classroom and you won't say anything. You won't do anything. And later you'll think of 10 things you could have said or done and wish you had. And then I think it is important to be able to come back the next day and, and revisit it to say class, you know, last yesterday, when we were talking about X, somebody said Y, and I was really bothered by that comment, but I didn't say anything at that time. Or I had a question about that point of view, and I wanted to ask it, but I didn't at that time. But I really, but it's continued to, I've continued to think about it, and I think it's worth us revisiting that conversation. So let me, you know, and I say, and I want to use that example to simply say, there will be times when you don't know what to say and you wish you had thought of the perfect answer and you think of it later. You can come back and use it later. You know, you can revisit it. Um, and I think that's important to remember. Great, definitely, thank you. So Rachel Renbarger, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, says you mentioned the that we're kind of acknowledging that this summer a lot of people are calling this summer the summer of racial reckoning racial yeah. reckoning. Um, what are some of the positive things that you've seen from parents teachers and or researchers in terms of things that are changing how are we moving forward well, one of the things that I've seen is a great desire on the part of many people to talk about issues related to race and racism in a way that is new. That seems new to me. Um, certainly, if you look at the New York Times bestseller list, there was a time when like nine out of the top 10 books were all about issues related to race. Um, it was white fragility. It was how to be an anti-racist. It was, so you want to talk about race. It was, you know, my book was even there. Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? There were so many books and the publisher of the, I had an interview. Somebody interviewed me from the times about my book because it was kind of unusual in as much as my book is as old as it is uh, to end up on the um, New York Times list this summer. Usually that's new books, right? That are there and so um, I was being interviewed about that, and the inter the interviewer said she had never 
seen anything like it in terms of so many books specific to this topic at one time on you know the bestseller list and so that lets me know that there is a thirst this summer that we hadn't seen previously to really learn more and i have received many requests specifically to speak to groups about how to talk about race and racism with children so i know that there are many parents who are trying to figure out white parents in particular but not just white parents um, how to figure out how to have conversations with their kids how to interrupt what i call the cycle of racism um, in their own families one of the things that is common for many people and i actually i'm going to take a moment and ask this question of this audience we can't see them but people can think about you know i'm going to imagine y'all raising your hands um, if you were to ask if you were to ask a room full of people to think about their own earliest race related memory um, and then you just you know give them a minute or two and then i would i could ask you to i won't ask you what it is but just have you thought of something Jen's nodding her head. She has. Allison, you're not sure. You're thinking oh, about it. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to just keep, I just keep trying to go back and back and back. And I, I don't. It, it doesn't have to be like child. I mean, for some people. So let me just share. Yeah. Um, so Jen, are, how old are you in your example? The third grade. Yeah. Third grade, did you say? Yeah, about third yeah. grade. Maybe fourth grade, third or fourth grade, right in there. Okay. So, so third grade would be like eight. Um, and many people will have an elementary school memory. Allison, you might not. For some people, it might be high school or sometimes it's even college. It has everything to do with where you grew up and what the population was like. But for many people, they have a memory that could be five, six, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. In your case, Jen, you mentioned third grade. Um, and if you, but if you ask a group, a room full of adults, most people can remember something and most people will tell you that it took place during their elementary school years. And then you, um, if you ask how old, you know, they'll tell you the ages, but then if you ask what emotion is attached to the thing they remember, for a lot of people, it's some emotion of discomfort. It might be fear, it might be anger, it might be sadness, it might be shame or embarrassment. It might be confusion, just like not knowing really what's going on. Um, and for some people, it might be happiness or friendliness. I mean, it could have to do with a friendship. But for a lot of people, their earliest memory related to race has something to do with discomfort. And if you ask, did you talk to anyone, a parent or a teacher, a concerned adult? Um, I saw you shaking your head no, Jen. Um, most people will say that. Most people will say they did not. Mm -hmm. Even though years later they can remember it, they didn't talk about it at the time. So the question is, why not? You know, if you have spent any time with six or seven or even eight year olds, they're pretty chatty. You know, they tell you a lot of things you don't want to know. <laughs> um, and so if we understand that even young children are learning early that you're not supposed to talk about these things, that for some reason it's just not to be mentioned. Keep it to yourself. Fast forward to high school years, college years, adult years as a teacher, um, you've had many years to internalize a feeling of don't talk about it. So what does that mean? It means that now I'm getting ready to lead a conversation in my classroom and what I find is that I'm feeling really nervous about that. My palms are sweaty. I'm anxious. Maybe even my kids are anxious. We're all anxious. And that anxiety often keeps us from having these conversations. So what I see that's different about this summer is that people are wanting to push past that anxiety, push past that discomfort, and have the conversation anyway. 
And that to me is pretty, um, is both intriguing and encouraging because you can't solve a problem you can't talk about. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's once one person starts to talk about it, you feel more empowered to. Yes. And you're like, oh, I have people to talk about this with and, and things improve. Um, yeah. Okay. Steve Jones from Durham, North Carolina asks, what are the things that make you optimistic about the future of America? Will it oh, get goodness. better? <laughs> Today wow. might not be the best day to ask. Let me well, just say. <laughs> what events that are happening now do you think will shape our thinking about race relations in the future? Um, well, I do, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of um, reading going on, a lot of book clubs having conversations, um, a lot of uh, teachers. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, um, you know, I'm active on Twitter. And I've been seeing a lot of Twitter exchanges between educators about their summer book reading lists. You know, what they've been reading and talking to people and, and I've had the opportunity, much like we're having this Zoom call tonight, I've had the opportunity to participate in some uh, large educator book group discussions. And so that's encouraging, right? Because people are obviously wanting to lean into the conversation um, one of the things that I find encouraging, all the protests that have happened, one of the things, particularly earlier in the summer, um, when so many of those protests were so clearly multiracial, um, you know, that there was a time when I was growing up, you know, you would see protests and of course there were always some white people who were part of, you know, the freedom marches or whatever, but it was largely, um, African Americans or other people of color who were out front, uh, you know, getting beat on the bridge, so to speak. Um, but in the um, summer, we've seen lots of people, all ages and all races, um, marching together in a way that leads me to feel hopeful about the possibility of social change in that way. Great, thank you. Um, do you have any last minute or last thoughts on ways that we can encourage our students and college colleagues to become active anti-racists? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is help them understand what racism is. And um, so let me talk a little bit about that. In my, um, in my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, I have a chapter on definitions. And in that chapter, I use an analogy, I, I call it the moving walkway, right? Um, but here's the thing. Sometimes when we talk about racism, uh, we use prejudice and racism interchangeably. Mm. Um, and I think that leads to confusion. But certainly we know that prejudice is an attitude. Right, prejudice has to do with attitudes, ideas, often based on limited information, typically stereotypes that convey, um, and, and we think of prejudices as negative. You could have a positive prejudice about something, but, but certainly a, you know, a, um, a predisposition, an attitude. But when we talk about racism, we are not just talking about attitudes, we're also talking about systems. Um, policies and practices that weave together. So those policies and practices are supported uh, by attitudes, but a person could have, as they say, love in their heart and still be engaging in racist policies and practices without necessarily having animosity, feelings of animosity toward a group. So we need to understand racism as bigger than just somebody's individual attitude. And when we talk about racist behavior, we tend to talk about um, what Peggy McIntosh refers to as individual acts of meanness. You know, we think of something as racist if I've done it on purpose and I'm, you know, using racial slur or I'm uh, discriminating against someone or, um, but again, we don't, and we would all agree that, you know, somebody's burning a cross on your lawn, that's racist behavior. But um, there are lots of people who would never do those things, but who still 
are um, engaging in uh, implicit bias. You know, they might not even be aware of their biases, but they are um, giving preference to one group over another. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this resume uh, with John Smith's name on it um, and seeing it more favorably than the identical resume with the name Jamal Jackson on it. Um, you know, that, that that kind of bias is also part of racism in our society, but not necessarily intentional or even always part of our conscious awareness. So if we think about racism as this big system, I think about it as this moving walkway. So what do I mean by the moving walkway? It's as though we are, if we think of that moving walkway at the airport, like a big conveyor belt, we're sort of, we step on to, we're born into a system, uh, we step onto that conveyor belt and we're carried along. And some people are encouraged to actively embrace racist ideology. And those people might be walking fast on the moving walkway. They want to go where that walkway is taking them because they believe in white supremacy or whatever. But most people are not walking fast. Most people are just standing still. And they might say, I'm not doing anything. I'm not calling anybody names. I'm not engaging in any harmful behavior. I'm just standing here. But because the system is operating, they too are being carried along. And in their passivity, they are going along with the system. Then there are other people who will say, I see the problem here. I don't want to participate in what I see these are as, you know, these policies, these practices, I don't want to be part of that system. I'm turning around. Imagine that, turning around on the walkway. But unless you move, now you're just traveling backwards and you don't see where you're going, but you're still being carried along. It is only when you actively walk in the opposite direction, faster than the conveyor belt is moving, that you can actually interrupt the process. And that's what being an active anti-racist is about. It's about moving faster than the walkway is carrying to actively interrupt the process. And so um, if we want to be change agents, that's what we have to do. We have to be actively engaged in doing things that can interrupt the cycle of racism. Otherwise, we are just either contributing by our passivity or contributing by our action, but we are contributing to the racist system unless we're actively walking against it. Great. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hope that's well, clear. No, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We had a ton of questions in the Q&A. One was, can you ask her to not stop talking? I could listen to her forever. <laughs> I, <laughs> but, I love to, Jen, to share. <laughs> I love that. But we do have to, you know, respect our, our long time limit. Um, and I have pages and pages of notes, and I'm really excited about some ideas. And hopefully everyone who is participating in this is is finding wonderful resources. Um, I, yeah, I am like, I think his name was John. I could do this for three more hours, but um, <laughs> yeah, that was you, past my bedtime, so. Um. You've definitely given us a lot of things to think about and excellent resources. And everyone in the chat is just saying how wonderful, wonderful this was. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we appreciate you taking time out of your night to do this with us and, um, I can't say enough for this conversation. So, so thank you very much. Well, I can see some of those thank yous in the chat. I want to thank everyone for their um, wonderful feedback and thank the two of you for being great conversation partners. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Tatum and um, enjoy your evening. Yeah. Thank you. You too. Thank Bye -bye. you.